History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We are digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. And maybe some laughs along the way. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is The Quintessential Guide of the Rocky Mountains. So, I think on one of our most recent episodes, you mentioned that I and and also my family have repeatedly driven across the country, and I guess I wanted to start off by talking about that experience a little bit, since I just finished driving from Ohio to Las Vegas and had a chance to explore some of the areas and states and countryside that we're going to be talking about today. You are the Rocky Mountain Explorer of the History's B-Side podcast. <laughs> I guess so. I mean, I mean, between the two of us. Yeah. I mean, I know you mentioned you, you've never been out that far. No, I, I mean, I think it would be fun, but like the furthest west I've driven is Omaha, Nebraska. So mm-hmm. like definitely not Rocky Mountains <laughs> when I've driven through Iowa. Just flat farmland. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, those. The, no offense to anybody in those flyover states, but they're pretty rough to drive through. I mean, Iowa's miserable. Apologies if we have any <laughs> listeners in Iowa, but like, all it is is long, straight cornfields and windmills. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much how Kansas is and Nebraska and pretty much every other flyover state I've driven through. But every time I drive through it, and I say every time, our listeners, I guess, should know that I've done the drive myself three or four times my parents have done it i don't know like eight nine times i lost count between them driving back and forth to portland and to las vegas to see my sister (laughs) but yeah i mean those states can definitely get really boring to drive through i mean there's things here and there that you can definitely go see especially in kansas i found a couple things but they were all like an hour out of the way and sometimes you just want to get done with the drive i feel like when you're taking a drive that long it really doesn't matter if it takes one extra hour to go see some other states or to go out of your way a little bit. And right. listen, if you're driving that far, you might as well go out of your way. Like, yeah. like I just said, there's nothing in Iowa. So my family drove an hour or two out of the way to go see the Field of Dreams movie site because oh, that's yeah. the one thing in Iowa worth seeing if you're a baseball <laughs> fan. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, the, the drive definitely sounds terrible. But I mean, I've done it a couple different ways and broken it up into different um different days and taken you know three days or five days to do it yeah. and stopped in each state um, in this most recent time you know i stopped in louisville and kansas city and denver so i think if you break it up it's not that bad but the thing that always strikes me when i drive it is a the the just immense vastness of our country and how big our nation is I mean, you drive across these states for hours and hours and these long straight roads at 80 miles an hour. And in addition to just the natural scenery, especially once you get to the mountains being kind of intimidating, I just always try to go back to remembering that people crossed this on foot and on wagons, you know, <laughs> pulled by ox. And it's it's always it kind of blows my mind to think about that, that they, they would spend days driving through flat land and then get to the Rockies and how disheartening that might have been. Especially when you kind of have no idea like what you're going to run into. Like with us, we're driving on a highway, you know, it's going to be paved roads and trees or some other kind of landscape off to the side. Exactly. Then they're literally forging paths through areas that people haven't been through. And you don't know if you're going to come up on mountains or I don't know, some kind of harsher terrain or yeah. bad weather. Like you have no idea what you're in for. It's not like the comforts of being in your family sedan or exactly SUV. Yeah. Like nowadays we have cruise control and comfy seats and music and Bluetooth and podcasts. And there's all these places along the highway to stop. But it, it's just incredible that people just pack their stuff into these wooden boxes <laughs> and took off across the country. I'm endlessly floored by the human courage involved in that pursuit well fortunately your ox and cattle don't need high quality petroleum (laughs) i mean that's true but i don't remember needing to ford any rivers in my chevy cruise like we (laughs) did in oregon trail and environmental science class (laughs) did we do that in that class yeah i remember playing it in elementary school 
Yeah, we found some online version that was like really crappy and pixelated, but you could plug like your friend's name in. And I remember that because Jess ended up dying of dysentery. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we like found some version online that you could yeah. download or play online that was just reminiscent of the, I don't know, what was that? early 2000s version that we had yeah. on our elementary school computers yeah the little 8-bit <laughs> or whatever that is yeah but yeah we we put in our friends and saw who would make it across the country and <laughs> i don't know if any of us ever actually did maybe that's the realistic part of the game <laughs> to be honest though when i played that game in like elementary school i think we got to the first settlement stopover area spent our entire budget on like ammunition and then as soon as you got to a part in the game where you could hunt <laughs> we just sat there and did that because that was the fun part was like yeah. shooting birds and stuff that flew across and then you like have all this meat because you wasted all your money on ammo whatever you killed would be stocked up in your uh food stores <laughs> and then it would spoil by like the next round and you'd be out of money out of food and everyone would be dying yeah <laughs> before you even make it to the next town and i think that's probably how it was for a lot of people i mean <laughs> We're, we're talking about how hard it would be. So, like, I think that's the reason why it was a really dangerous and risky thing to do, and a lot of people perished. But our topic for today is a man by the name of Jim Bridger, who was kind of a navigational savant when it came to the Rocky Mountains and an area that we'll discuss called the Louisiana Territory, which was one of the largest land purchases in U.S. history and a huge swath of land. But... Jim had a knack for navigating it almost with the same ease we would be able to navigate around our neighborhood. And he had this perfect map of the entire region in his head and could go back and explore different trails and routes and passes that, you know, he hadn't before and kind of add them to that that map in his head. And as a result, he was really kind of one of the most talented and quintessential guides of the Rocky Mountain region during this time when lots of settlers and pioneers were exploring it and it's i mean if you've ever been like backpacking in wilderness it is really hard to to navigate things do get yeah. i mean kind of twisted around in your head and you know hills and mountains confuse you as far as the direction you never know what the topography is going to be you run into canyons that you can't cross and you have to go back so i mean it, without marked trails it would be horribly difficult to navigate the rocky mountains on foot i think granted i haven't spent that much time like wandering through wilderness aside from marked trails in like yeah just regular woods and forests and stuff but right. even in when when we're in cities and stuff like rita's made the comment that she has no sense of direction and <laughs> it's a good thing she's with me when we visit a new city because i quickly find my bearings and can get around the city but like that's walking around a city blocks with marked streets right, and square. landmarks and like it's really easy to say hey we saw this business here or we were on this street right. and we need to head this way to wherever we're going but like to walk through wilderness where it's mostly unmarked trails or it's stuff that you might not have seen before or you have seen it but you're moving at such slow pace that it might have been days or weeks or months ago the last time you walked past this point like that's what's yeah. incredible about people like this Right. And I think that's why a lot of people don't realize how easily you can get lost when you don't have those kinds of markers. And that's why men like Jim Bridger were necessary and important to the settling of the American West. He and others like him basically acted as guides for the first trailblazers to make, you know, these paths for people to, to take so they wouldn't get lost. But before we talk about his story, I do want to cover the American frontier a little bit, because I think we all have this mythical storybook idea of the American frontier, but I honestly don't know too much about it beyond the name Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. The American frontier began with a settlement at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, and since that time, it was basically pushed west, always sitting just beyond the edge of established American settlements. So this might be kind of a dumb question, but is the American frontier like an actual thing, or is it just like the idea of what is part of our land but not yet known, like where we, yeah. where we can expand to but we haven't yet reached? Or is it this actual thing that it, it's like the moving border of the new country? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good way to look at it. That's exactly what it is. It It is this 
space that is constantly moving and encompasses whatever is just beyond our current settlements. So I guess, I mean, in some ways, the American frontier still exists in like Alaska or northern Canada, maybe. Alaska is pretty much the undiscovered American <laughs> frontier that yeah. there might be some people living there that we do claim to be Americans, but it's just a frozen desert. <laughs> <laughs> right. So obviously at present, almost the entirety of the continental United States has been thoroughly explored and developed, but... By the 1800s and the time of Jim Bridger's life, the western edge of the United States was made up of Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia, with the Indiana, Mississippi, and Orleans territories to the west. From the Mississippi to the Rocky Mountains, the sprawling Louisiana territory stretched as far north as Canada and as far south as present-day Texas. Hmm. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson paid the French $15 million for the Louisiana territory. This didn't make it U.S. land, though, which is what I previously thought. It only gave the United States a preemptive right to obtain land in this area by treaty or conquest to the exclusion of other European powers. So was that really just to prevent the French from trying to claim the land as theirs? Like, were there other European powers in this area that were trying to claim it for themselves? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah... Essentially, it was to prevent the French and other European powers. I mean, there I have to imagine the English, the Spanish, maybe the Portuguese, the Dutch at this point were all, I mean, at some point staking claims to land in North America. So it was really just a way for the United States to kind of gain this preemptive, like it says, preemptive right to obtain this land to the exclusion of other European powers. But the land was still inhabited. It was still controlled by indigenous tribes in North America. So going back to Jefferson real quick, the 15 million he paid, that was in 1803 dollars or was that in today's money? That's in 1803 dollars. Oh, wow. So that's really like an enormous sum of money Yeah, for that, that time period. Yeah. I mean, like we've previously discussed, the inflation calculators don't go back that far, but Yes, an absolutely enormous amount of money. I mean, I'm sure it would cost quite a bit of money to purchase new land today to add to any country. But still, like, I'm just amazed that they would have spent that much money to, I guess, have the right to this land and not even to necessarily acquire it to make it a part of the country. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think what you have to remember, kind of unfortunate fact, is that the European powers were, including the United States, I keep saying European powers, but... The, the major world powers coming out of the West had this kind of arrogant view that, you know, we're going to talk about manifest destiny in a moment, but they kind of had this view that they were going to civilize these, these lands. And so even though it didn't technically give them the ownership of the land just yet, I don't know that there's ever any doubt in Jefferson's mind or in the United States government's mind <laughs> that we were not going to eventually explore and claim that land for ourselves and i mean that's part of this country's troubled past but i think jefferson saw the value in that land i think he saw the economic potential that it had and in fact i mean it is you look at what's there it's where most of america's food production comes from which is a a huge export for our economy so yes it was a lot of money but i think jefferson and his advisors probably saw the the potential and saw that it was a good investment. And that's why he soon after enlisted Meriwether Clark and William Lewis to explore the area, their route beginning in St. Louis and ending in Fort Clatsop in the Oregon coast. Meriwether is a name that we need to bring back into like the American lexicon. <laughs> that's a good name. I'll name my firstborn. Meriwether Melito. Meriwether. <laughs> yeah. He Perfect. won't get picked on at all in school. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Jefferson enlists Clark and Lewis to explore this new territory that the U.S. had just purchased. And their route up the Missouri River and then down the Columbia River in between Oregon and Washington to the coast basically laid the groundwork for this, this huge rapid westward expansion of the 1800s. 
which was fueled by things like the gold rush, the fur trade, the creation of the Oregon Trail, and this idea called Manifest Destiny, which was a widely held belief of that time that the United States had a divinely ordained right to expand to the Pacific Ocean and beyond. Of course. (laughs) So the fur trade in particular gives rise to the American legend of the mountain man as demand for fur encouraged entrepreneurs to expand their operations, sending trappers into the backcountry. So do you know much about the fur trade, like the economics behind it or who some of the major people involved were? Like, I feel like I just have this base knowledge that the fur trade was just hunters went out and collected furs and then sold them to people. Like, I, I guess I don't have a concept of how important fur was and why it was such a big deal. Yeah, so... The fur trade became fashionable in the 1800s, partially due to European fashion. The use of North American furs, particularly the raccoon skin hats that are so widely known. And you can see, I mean, in pictures of Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone, they're wearing one. But those were extraordinarily fashionable in Europe. And as a result, demand skyrocketed and fur traders and entrepreneurs were happy to fill that gap. One of the largest players was a company called the Hudson Bay Company. And the Hudson Bay Company was started by two Frenchmen who, with the help of various investors, began what would become the largest fur trading company in the world. And their, I mean, their economic control was on par with that of the East India Trading Company. They had a virtual monopoly over the fur trade in North America. By the 1800s, they had gotten so powerful that they were even starting small wars with companies that competed with them and acted as a de facto government for a lot of the Western Rocky Mountain Canadian and American territories. Yeah, yeah. Why does Hudson Bay sound to me like it's some brand of patio furniture that they sell at home depot i feel like there's a brand name that's like that (laughs) i mean it there is a retail brand is it really yeah the the canadian retail brand hbc was the hudson bay company but now just operates retail stores in canada no longer doing the fur trade but i don't know if they make patio furniture but i can i i understand what you're saying i can kind of see the logo almost like the brand name logo of hudson bay on we're gonna have to look that up on our break (laughs) i need to know this yeah so the hudson bay company and others like them happily responded to the demand for fur and began sending frontiersmen and mountain men and trappers into the backcountry to fetch the high-priced fur and this required skilled men that could navigate the terrain navigate the rocky mountains and successfully bring back the product and one of the most talented and skilled trappers was a man by the name of jim bridger who is going to be our topic for today but before we get into his life we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back matt you like coffee right i love coffee would you ever want to buy me a coffee anytime phil just say the word You know, our dedicated listeners could also buy me a coffee. Could they buy me a coffee as well? They could buy you a coffee. This sounds fantastic. We set up this service called Buy Me a Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And people can buy us a coffee? Yeah. It's really just a way for people to support the show if they enjoy the show. And if they're listening to the show, we sure hope you enjoy it. Yeah, otherwise you're just, I mean, wasting your time. At buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side, there's three ways that our listeners can interact with the show. Number one, you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member for $10 a month or $100 a year. Being a member gains you some pretty cool perks. You get access to our monthly bonus episode, history's b-side battles access to our future episode queue a name shout out on a future episode we'll also send you a handwritten thank you postcard and sticker set and more perks will be announced as we continue on there's also some different extras that people can get on our buy me a coffee website 
things like choosing the topic for a future episode. If there's a person, lesser known person in history that you have an interest in, let us know and we'll do an episode all about them. You can also buy sets of custom postcards, sticker sets, and future merchandise that we add on there as well. Or you can draft your own advertisement script and we will promote whatever you want in a segment like this. The website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. Matt? Yeah? You owe me a coffee. Oh. Do I get a coffee too? You're buying. All right. All right, welcome back. So we've got the lay of the land, if you will, uh, about the American frontier. And now we're going to get into Jim Bridger's early life before we start talking about some of his tremendous feats. So he was born James Felix Bridger on March 17th in 1804 in Richmond, Virginia, to an innkeeper, James Bridger, and his wife, Chloe. He was born just two months before Lewis and Clark's expedition. In 1812, his father moved the family to an Illinois farm near St. Louis, which then sat on the edge of the vast American frontier. Here, he trained as a blacksmith apprentice, learned to handle boats, and became a skilled rifleman and woodsman. However, he did not receive a formal education and was illiterate for his entire life. So is he sort of, I mean, I guess he kind of reminds me of like the uh, Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone type, like yeah. lesser known, obviously, which kind of makes him in the B-sider realm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was this sort of storyteller, mythical fantasy about mountain men at this time. And there were a lot of men coming back from the wilderness and embellishing their stories and talking about their feats, some of which were true, but oftentimes were, like I said, exaggerated or embellished. But yeah, exactly like Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone. Yeah, I mean, he obviously won't have the same future career that those two had, but right. sort of the humble beginnings of and outdoorsmen and everything like that but without the education background and still kind of making a success out of himself right heading out into the american frontier yeah exactly i mean he's definitely on par with the two of them just with less fame in march of 1822 at age 18 jim left his apprenticeship after responding to a missouri newspaper ad calling for 100 enterprising young men to ascend the river Missouri to its source, there to be employed for one, two, or three years by William Henry Ashley and Andrew Henry's Rocky Mountain Fur Company. Would you have taken this job recruitment ad? I don't know. I, I, I'd like to think I would. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know. At this time, like we've talked about, it was really dangerous and risky. Yeah, you're going to go hike upstream. You don't know if you'll be there for one to three years. Just... It doesn't even really say what you're going yeah. to be doing. You just have to be enterprising and a young man, and you're going to travel and then be employed there for right. a couple of years. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's kind of like a historical version of the gap year abroad you see now where you can go work in some you know exotic location for a period of time. But I don't know. I think I, I like to think, like I said, I, I think I like to think I would have responded to it again, I have no concept of how dangerous this would have been. <laughs> and, you know, I doubt they had any sort of like work safety guidelines. <laughs> you don't think they had OSHA guidelines back then? Yeah, no, they had you had to have the poster on <laughs> on the back of your wagon. So he responds to this ad calling for these young men to ascend the river Missouri. And a note on the Missouri River begins in western Montana at the confluence of the Jefferson, Madison, and Gallatin Rivers, just outside the aptly named town of Three Forks. It runs through Montana and the Dakotas and forms the eastern border of Nebraska and Kansas, and then runs from Kansas City east, finally joining the Mississippi in St. Louis. The Ashley Party included many soon-to-be-famous mountain men, including Jedediah Smith, a trader known for being the first European man to enter California by land from the east. And I kind of love that, like, record and how many qualifiers it requires. Like, the first white European man to enter California by land from the east. <laughs> like, how many qualifiers do you have to put in front of your, uh, your record before it's not really a record and just something you did after a bunch of other people? <laughs> They're like... 
baseball analytics. <laughs> They're like the first left-handed 24-year-old pitcher from <laughs> the state of Nebraska to throw a one-hit game through six innings on a Tuesday with rain in the forecast. Right. Yeah, like we have to have our record, but there were like, you know, a couple thousand, a couple hundred thousand people here before us, so... <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, though, we don't celebrate enough European men, and it's about time that they get their recognition. Exactly. Yes. History <laughs> has not always been fair to the European men. Yes. What a what a poor, downtrodden, <laughs> forgotten group of people, if there ever was one. In fairness, we know the order that we're publishing these episodes, and our last episode was a European man, and the next episode is a European man, so maybe they get enough attention. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to do someone else soon. <laughs> so to get back to our European white man of the, the week, <laughs> um, <laughs> though he was uneducated, Jim Bridger was a brilliant survivalist and had a keen talent for finding his way in the wilderness. He was adept at learning indigenous dialects and culture and had a tremendous memory for geographic detail. He could fully and accurately describe any region he traveled through as well as those around it, and even draw accurate maps by memory, including geographical details and topography. It's interesting, too, because you think that's a skill that you would equate with literacy. Right. And the fact that he had no education and couldn't read or write, but he could draw out or at least communicate these detailed maps of yeah. areas that he's just traveled through. Are, it's really impressive. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, completely uneducated. He can't read, but I don't know. He just had this innate insane talent for direction hmm. and navigation and i think that was why he was able to draw out these maps i don't even know for a fact that they had any english written on them like they could have just been pictures so he joins the ashley party and it's with this expedition he begins a legendary 20-year period of exploration passing on foot through an enormous area the boundaries of which were the canadian border the missouri river the colorado new mexico border and Idaho and Utah. Yeah, I mean, we started this episode with you talking about driving through these states and yeah. how long that took. Like, he was traveling essentially on foot or by livestock pulled cart, <laughs> cattle pulled cart. Like, right. that's amazing. Yeah. But we also talked about how none of these were, like, established areas yet. Like, right. they weren't states. Canada wasn't a country yet. These weren't really, like, borders. So... I mean, do you know what these were? Were they just considered independent territories or, I mean, I guess it's just indigenous land, right? I mean, technically, yeah, I guess it depends on who you ask, but yeah, I think it, I mean, in, in my mind, it was indigenous land. Uh, this land was considered a territory that the, the U.S., like I said, had that preeminent right claim to, but they were essentially wild territories, though that didn't really stop the U.S. army from treating it as though it was our land as they moved west. But I think that also makes this all the more impressive. Like, they, I mean, this isn't even an area where you can call for help to anybody. Or, you know, if you just get killed by a group of outlaws or an indigenous tribe, like, no one's, no one's coming to save you. Right, yeah. In 1824, he was the first European to explore the Great Salt Lake at 21 years old though due to its salinity, he believed it to be the Pacific Ocean at the time. Right, right. That's understandable. I mean, you don't really know right. where you are. Yeah. He's the first one there. Yeah. I, I'm not going to fault him for that. <laughs> in 1825, he became famous for his part in an expedition that brought $50,000 in fur back from a trading rendezvous. And that's in 1825 dollars? Yeah, yeah, 1825 dollars. Wow. A lot of risk went into... No, but that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, an enormous sum of money. During the expedition, though, he ended up leaving the party and entered Bighorn Canyon in Montana by himself. Here, he fashioned a raft out of driftwood and completed the first recorded float of the turbulent Bighorn River. Well, he knew where he was going. Yeah, you know, he, he had it down, I think. But, I mean, it's kind of incredible, because imagine being one of the other men in that party. This guy just disappears down a canyon and then reappears several days later out of the wilderness claiming that he 
floated down this river in a raft made out of driftwood that no one's ever floated before. And it kind of solidified him as this more mythical mountain man than just your average fur trapper. Are we, as a podcast, accepting this as truth, or are we saying that he made up this story? Um, I don't know. I, th- I mean, I think he did it. I do. I don't know that, like I said, all of these men embellished their stories, so I don't know okay. how completely <laughs> true this whole, the entire story is, but, you know, a, a lot of the men who received him when he returns, you know, went on to tell this story as it were true, so I think they believed it. I think he certainly would have been capable of it, but I guess I'll let our listeners decide for themselves since we can't really verify this at all. Right. Yeah. Bridger was also one of the first men to explore the Yellowstone region and helped establish the first fur trading post on the Yellowstone river. After his employment with the Rocky mountain fur company, Bridger worked for several years as an independent trapper before joining with three partners to buy out control of the company from Ashley in 1830. Life as a businessman suited him ill, and he eventually sold out in 1834, returning to the trapping lifestyle. If you like what you do, you don't work a day in your life. Yeah, so I I mean, I think he just grew tired and weary of the day-to-day office work that went into running a business like this and preferred himself to just be out in the wilderness as much as possible. That same year, Jim married the daughter of a flathead chief by the name of Cora, who would accompany him on his expeditions. By the 1840s, he grew tired of the nomadic life, and in 1843 established Fort Bridger in southwestern Wyoming as a way station and trading post for the growing crowds of emigrants on the Oregon Trail. The fort became a vital resupply point for wagons on the Oregon, California, and Mormon trails, and was also used by the United States Army. Bridger happily settled down with Cora, and together they had three children. Now, before you get excited for a happy ending, remember that this is history we're talking about, and as we've established, it sucks. In 1846, Cora died of a fever, and his firstborn daughter, Mary Ann, was killed during an indigenous tribal raid. Jeez. He then married the daughter of a Shoshone chief, who died during childbirth shortly thereafter. He retreated into the mountains to trap after each of these tragedies and spent time living with various Shoshone tribes. Of course you include the sad part. Well, I mean, I I did say, I did give a warning. (laughs) But it is interesting that he returns to trapping after tragedies. Yeah. Like, do you think that's because he has necessity to, just to make his livelihood to provide for himself? Or is it more like a a comfort thing like this is what he knows to do and it's what he's good at and settling down didn't fare very well for him so he went back to his nomadic style i think it was more out of comfort out of a need for comfort and solace i imagine at this point in his life you know he's purchased a fur trading company he's been a successful trader for 20 years i think he'd he's probably financially pretty well off he set up his own fort in wyoming Mm -hmm. So I think it was more out of comfort solace, you know, when we're met with a tragedy like this and an enormous amount of trauma and grief that comes with it, we all tend to return to what we know and what we love and our passion to distract ourselves. And I think that was, this was his version of that. You know, he was just more comfortable in the woods, in the wilderness. Yeah. In 1850, he married his third wife, Mary Washaki Bridger, also the daughter of a Shoshone chief. He and Mary raised two children together, spending summers in Fort Bridger and winters with the Shoshone. My man's got a type. (laughs) Yes, yes he does. He and Mary raised two children together, spending summers in Fort Bridger and winters with the Shoshone. That same year, while trying to find an alternate route to the South Pass in Wyoming, he discovered what would become known as Bridger's Pass. It shortened the Oregon Trail by 61 miles. Now, it is noted that Bridger's Pass didn't become a super popular route, uh, partially due to it just not being publicized well and <laughs> the information wasn't spread. But, I mean... Pretty useful, though. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a tremendous feat. I I mean, I, did, I didn't discover a trail that shortened <laughs> the Oregon Trail by 61 miles today. What did you do? <laughs> 
I can barely do my own house chores. Well, you know what? <laughs> Millennials have it really tough in the 21st century. So, you know, <laughs> the mountain man weren't that great. No. Well, and the thing is, he didn't even Instagram it. So how do we know he even really did it? Yeah. Like, how do people know what's going on in their life if they're not posting on right. TikTok every day? Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine if he if he would have had a TikTok or an Instagram, he could have had a, a little bit more publicity for his past. He would have <laughs> he would have had some great Instagram pictures, though. Oh, definitely. I mean, can you imagine he would have been like the best nature photographer? Just discovered a new route. Hashtag for the gram. <laughs> Blessed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I feel like in modern times, Jim Bridger would have ended up as a guide for like wilderness instagram instagram influencers <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah in 1853 members of the latter-day saints church who resented the competition from fort bridger tried to arrest jim as an outlaw what competition was there between fort bridger and the lds church well so because the mormons were one of the first groups of settlers to move out west they did establish a lot of the trading posts and so along the Oregon Trail and the California and Mormon Trails, the Mormons ran a lot of the posts. And so Fort Bridger would have been in direct economic competition with them. So it would have been people traveling along this route would be going to Fort Bridger instead of their own real source right. of income from outsiders. Right, exactly. Okay. Luckily, Jim was able to escape into the mountains with Mary and their children. But a band of Latter-day Saints burned and gutted the fort, destroying his supplies. Fearing for the safety of his family, he relocated to a farm in Missouri, where he left Mary and his children to enlist as a scout for the U.S. government. He guided numerous expeditions, including Colonel Albert Sidney Johnson's invasion of Utah during the Utah War in 1857 and 1858. Now, I want to stop for a moment, because I myself had never heard of the Utah Wars, and I imagine many of our listeners haven't either. So amid persecution, the Latter-day Saints or Mormons fled to the territory of Utah, which at the time was known as Alta, California. They fled hoping to find refuge in the American West. But as American expansion moved westward and the American army began encroaching on the Utah territory, the Latter-day Saints began to take defensive actions. Their direct orders were to annoy the U.S. Army at all opportunities. They would stampede their livestock, burn the brush around them, hoping to catch their wagons on fire. They would set off alarming sounds in the middle of the night. <laughs> Pretty much everything but direct violent military yeah. conflict. The Latter-day Saints tried to just make the U.S. Army's life a living hell. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, you know, how the U.S. Army rolls... They had had enough, and they invaded Utah. And it's, it should be stated that before we give the Mormons this underdog role here, they were pretty violent. They would attack settlers moving west. They were known specifically for massacring over 100 settlers from Missouri and Arkansas in southwest Utah in an event known as the Mountain Meadows Massacre. So they weren't exactly a peaceful group of people just trying to get away to a place where they wouldn't be persecuted. In addition to helping Albert Sidney's party, Jim Bridger also helped the Berthoud party discover a route from Denver to the Great Salt Lake and helped numerous other expeditions to the Yellowstone Basin. And honestly, I wonder how many of the routes he discovered or trailblazed are now like, you know, highways or interstates. Sure they are. I mean, not all of them, but I'm right. sure a lot of them eventually were converted to highways if they're easier to travel through the mountains. Yeah, I mean you think it makes the most sense like if it was the easiest to travel on foot then it would be the easiest to you know pave and maintain by 1868 bridger's eyesight was failing him and he suffered from rheumatism he retired to his missouri farm where he cared for apple trees until his death on july 17th 1881 at the age of 77 and i don't know why but this just makes me happy and chuckle a little bit because this guy who was most at home in the wilderness and in the woods, constantly exploring, is content to just tend to his apple trees. <laughs> he had a busy life. He wanted to settle down. Yeah, I mean, it's fair. It's fair. Health failing you, I can see 
just wanting to settle down on a farm. So I want to talk a bit at the end here about his legacy, uh, which I think is the biggest part of him, given that he's this mythical mountain man type. Jim Bridger was known not only as a mountaineer, but a fantastic storyteller. Though his stories of the Yellowstone geysers proved to be true, others were certainly grossly embellished or exaggerated. He claimed to have seen petrified forests, probably true, with petrified birds, not so true. And these petrified birds he told of were singing, <laughs> quote, petrified songs. <laughs> what? What is a petrified bird? Is that like a dead bird that's solidified or like... <laughs> I don't know. A terrified bird. I don't because know. Because petrified can have two meanings here. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I Like I said, these are grossly embellished stories from a mountain man that spent a lot of time by himself in the woods. <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> Maybe the birds are just really scared and that explains the petrified songs <laughs> of just being terrified shrieking oh my god that's a terrifying picture in my mind <laughs> that would be haunting yeah oh my goodness just being in the woods by yourself and all the birds are shrieking and terrified i've dealt with some birds this week and i will tell you about them <laughs> after the podcast because it is not relevant to this at all i feel like our listeners are missing out we should have like a bird podcast <laughs> telling our worst bird stories yeah honestly though i feel like that might be popular just like the sort of weird thing people <laughs> flock to. Let's just say that I unintentionally may have had some bird pets this week. <laughs> and we've talked about bird pets on our show before. And I am not a fan. I mean, early to mid 80s, Rick Melito might have been able to help you out. <laughs> In addition to his petrified bird story, he also had a famous story about being pursued by 100 Cheyenne warriors for several miles before being cornered in a box canyon, with the warriors bearing down on him. At this point in the story, he would go silent until the person asked him what happened, to which he would simply reply, well, they killed me, of course. And I don't, like, maybe I just don't get the 1800s humor, but I feel like this is almost like a bad dad joke, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> because it's also reported that he would laugh hysterically after telling it. I, <laughs> I know, like, dad jokes are supposed to be bad but i don't even get the punchline <laughs> i mean i think the idea is that people are expecting some sort of like heroic yeah amazing heroic defeat the hundred warriors right. yeah but then he's just like no no i i died <laughs> but obviously right. he didn't because he's standing before them <laughs> but yeah i mean just pretty rough dad joke humor <laughs> As the title of our episode would suggest, he's known as the quintessential mountain man of the Rockies, and his knowledge of the area was unparalleled. It's said that when he was talking to emigrants at Fort Bridger, Jim could give advice and directions to any party of any size headed anywhere on any trail. Well, yeah, of course he could do that. If they got lost and disappeared, no one I've would know. I've never seen those people in my life. <laughs> <laughs> They don't know where they're coming. You'd be like, they didn't come back for directions, so they right. must have yeah, got fine. there. And there actually was, I didn't read too thoroughly into it, but the Donner Party is this famous Oregon Trail party that just kind of disappeared. And it said that Jim Bridger gave them directions <laughs> at Fort Bridger before their eventual disappearance. I literally almost made that one of your quiz questions. <laughs> oh, and I'm really? glad I didn't because you brought it up. But so I've listened to podcasts about the Donner Party. And it is a really, really interesting story because they just kind of yeah. disappeared and were never found, I believe, if I'm remembering that yeah. right. And I was like, I want to make this one of your quiz questions because I knew he gave them directions. But also, <laughs> I didn't know how to explain that in our short quiz segment yeah. at the end of the episode yeah. and like do it justice. <laughs> That's kind of why I didn't go into it too much because it's this huge story. Maybe we can do an episode on it down the road. But yeah. Definitely not a good reputation if you gave directions for a famous party of disappearing settlers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the quintessential guide that we called him to be. Yeah, right? Maybe he was just a big mountain con man, <laughs> just helping settlers to find their deaths and disappear in the wilderness. <laughs> the quintessential guide to Poyes. Yeah. <laughs> him and Gregor McGregor were in cahoots. Guys, I've got this great pass through the mountains that 
is rife with really friendly indigenous tribes. And the Rocky Mountains are lush with for growing yeah. corn. Right. Three harvests. The sun is always shining and you'll never die. In addition to Fort Bridger, it, which is actually a town now, I looked it up, its current population is a uh, whopping 181 people, which is down almost half from what it was 10 years ago when it was about 300 people. <laughs> oh no. In addition to Fort Bridger and Bridger's Pass, Jim also blazed an alternate route to the Bozeman Trail section of the Oregon Trail. Bridger Trail, as it became known, was a less famous route, but much safer from outlaw, indigenous, and LDS raids. So they rebuilt Fort Bridger? Didn't it get destroyed? Yeah. Or is this like a town that had the same name as the actual like stopover point? So there wasn't a lot of detail about it. I do. They did at some point rebuild it because it was said that it was used by the U.S. Army for several years and as also as a trading post here and there. But yeah, the fort was eventually rebuilt, restocked, and was operational. Bridger Teton National Forest and the Bridger Mountains in Wyoming and Montana are both named after him, along with dozens of landmarks, schools, and parks in the region. And for me to kind of wrap up, the biggest takeaway here is simply his sheer capability in the backcountry. I mean, even in his time, but especially now, his feats seem to add justification to the tall tales spun about him and the other mountain men of his time. And, I mean, I don't know how many of our listeners have backpacked or camped in the backcountry, but to be perfectly honest, it's not easy. It's really expensive if you, I mean, if you're going to get the right gear for most people to feel comfortable and safe <laughs> while doing it, it's expensive. Right. It's a, a huge physical effort. I mean, the the hardest physical thing I think I've ever done. And even crossing this terrain in, you know, a modern day car that we talked about has all these conveniences and tools at your disposal to make it more comfortable is an exhausting trip it's it's tiring it's hard to do i think you're coming across kind of soft in this episode i think you need to make your next trip across the country by uh wagon by trails or on foot yeah i'll, I'll get right to that <laughs> ditch the car matt it's better for the earth yeah that, i mean that's true eco matt is doing a poor job by using a vehicle to cross the united states <laughs> If Jim Bridger can do it, so can you. <laughs> yeah, maybe in my younger pre-COVID years, but I doubt our listeners want to hear us talk about my lack of quarantine physical fitness. <laughs> now let's just get to the quiz. All right, we will be right back. bake? Do you like history? Do you want to learn the history of the things you bake? Then you should listen to Hot Oven Time Machine, the podcast where we dive into the history of baking and try out recipes past and present. Hi, I'm Joseph, a master amateur baker. And I'm Monty, a master baker in training. Every episode, we go back in time to learn the history of baking. Then we bake and taste our favorite recipe of that baked good. We have some laughs and enjoy chit-chatting and learning about our favorite foods, all while exploring the rich history of baking and our time-traveling oven. Join us every other Wednesday to learn the history of all your favorite baked goods. All right, now we're getting into today's quiz section. We like to end every episode with just a short three-question quiz to kind of test today's host, see how much he studied his topic and everything in and around it. And maybe you, the <laughs> listener, is following along or know something about the topic already, so you could try to guess some of these on your own. Are you ready? Yeah, I feel good about this. These, I don't know, I don't think these will be terribly difficult. I think I mentioned you kind of jumped the gun on a couple of my prepared yeah. quiz questions. I was going <laughs> to No, I was going to ask a little bit about like the what caused the end of the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, but you touched on that a little bit just the fact that they were over hunting the beavers and fashion trends sort of changed so fur wasn't as popular and these fur companies started to fold into each other. Um so I guess that kind of ruined my first question for you. But 
then I'll, I mean, also the, the Donner party, I thought was a really interesting connection, but I didn't want to have to get into that whole explanation here. So I have one for you that's sort of about one of his adventures, hmm. but also ties back to our podcast. Oh, okay. I have one about modern day Fort Bridger, oh, and then one that is catered just to you, Mountain <laughs> Man Matt Melito. Oh, great. I can't wait. Question number one. In 1859, Jim Bridger was paid to be the chief guide on the Yellowstone-bound Reynolds expedition. And though they never made it to Yellowstone, the expedition did explore what area, which we discussed on a previous episode of History's B-Side. I'm not sure about this, but is it Jackson Hole? Like Teton? Correct. Okay. Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is located near the Teton Mountains and close to the Wyoming-Idaho border. Boom. We talked about Jackson, Wyoming, which is the only incorporated town within Jackson Hole, but they were notable for electing one of the first all-female town councils that we talked about on our first female mayor episode about petticoat rulers. Yeah, that's a nice little little connection to that old episode there. Yeah. Question number two. Real simple here. What is the Fort Bridger Rendezvous? Oh my god. I have no idea. <laughs> is it like a fur trade rendezvous? What is? This is a current thing. Oh gosh. I mean, I have no idea. That doesn't even sound familiar from my reading. <laughs> so the Fort Bridger Rendezvous is an annual reenactment of fur trading as it happened oh. from 1825 to 1840. Interesting. Between mountain men, Native Americans, fur trappers, and traders. It's held every year on the first weekend in September, which is Labor Day weekend, in Fort Bridger, Wyoming. It includes marksmanship contests with period-appropriate rifles, axe-throwing and archery competitions, as well as food and workshops that are representative of the time period. That honestly sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> it does sound fun. I want to go to we it. should do like a History's B-Side trip. Or maybe do like, I don't know, a side series about us traveling to different historical places and participating in historical reenactments though i'm pretty sure that's already a thing (laughs) yeah i mean that's pretty much a thing already maybe we should start that or we should go to the fort bridger rendezvous for a history's b-side live episode except we already did this topic so i don't know what we would do when is it it's labor day weekend oh so we have some time by the time this episode publishes we'll only be like a month away from it so we better start planning (laughs) yeah for sure it's gonna come up fast All right, and your final question. We might not have a ton of listeners who know the answer to this one unless they happen to live in the right places, Mm. but I don't know if you'll get this, but maybe you will. I think you have a chance at least. Oh, good. I'm I'm glad I have a chance at least. (laughs) You mentioned that there's a lot of things out west, there's your hint, that are named after Jim Bridger. Mm-hmm. Where, in what city, is Jim Bridger Elementary School located? Oh, Lord. Um, Utah? I, do I need, like, do you, you want to know the city, though? Um, maybe Salt Lake City? No. Dang. There are two correct answers, because there's two Jim Bridger Elementary Schools. Oh, the first one question. is West Jordan, Utah. But that's not the one I would have expected you to get. The other one is in Portland, Oregon. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh, how did I not know? And interesting enough, there's also a Bridger Avenue in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is where you currently are as we're recording this. I'll have to go find it and take a picture. Yep, and then we'll post it on our Instagram when we publish this episode, because we talk so much about Jim Bridger's Instagram. (laughs) Yeah, I'll have to go find both of those and... Get some good pictures for our listeners. <laughs> so check our Instagram feed at History's B-Side, and you can see a picture of a street sign that Matt is going to go find tomorrow. As usual, we really appreciate the support of our listeners. Um, we love doing this for you guys. It's a lot of fun, and we're happy you enjoy listening. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, please feel free to reach out to us at historiesbside at gmail.com. Or find us on social media at History's B-Side. We'd love to hear from you. And again, 
Thanks for your support. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service. And follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side.